revolutionary greetings and revolutionary salutations to you all, our viewers and listeners living and working in different parts of the world. My special guest today just recently published a book entitled Industries Without Smokesticks, Industrialization in Africa Reconsidered. This book was published by Oxford University Press and a copy of it can be accessed on the link that I'm going to paste right in the description panel on the upload for this video and in the comment section on our Facebook page. Professor Richard, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Sheila. It's a pleasure to be here with you and to participate in, uh, in your efforts to link up Africa with international and uh, international knowledge. I understand that um, you wrote this book together with other co-editors, uh, that is to say John Page, who is a senior fellow in the Global Economy and Development Program at Brookings Institute, uh, and Finn Tapp, who is a professor of development economics at the University of Copenhagen. This is a brilliant job that you did. I've been looking at your CV and I saw that you, you have had quite a profound uh, career, academic and both professional career. I've seen that you have once worked as a special representative of the World Bank to the United Nations and currently you are the director for uh, Rwanda and Uganda at the International Growth uh, Center. So can you just briefly describe the work that you do with this organization and that which you have done before uh, with the World Bank? Yes, the work uh, with the International Growth Center in Uganda and Rwanda uh, is attempting to link up international uh, scholars with domestic policymakers, ministers and the like, that might have particular uh, problems and uh, uh, needs for economic analysis. And so we provide that economic analysis to them uh, cost-free based upon a network of development economists all over the world, uh, not only in uh, Europe and uh, the United States, but also Latin America and uh, in East, Af East Asia. Uh, basically, the model is that uh, uh, we interact with ministers, we discuss problems that they might have that would be amenable to more information and more research. And then we try to set up programs that will analyze those questions empirically and provide those ministers with uh, studies and uh, available information. Before that, I had the good fortune of uh, working with the World Bank in, in Latin America and, uh, and East Asia, and ended up in uh, Geneva, where I was the representative to the WTO and other UN organizations. Uh, and there, it was a pleasure to uh, learn much more about the role of multilateral organizations, but also uh, the role of collective action, countries working together to solve particular problems, be it trade issues or climate change uh, uh, or health issues. Uh, so uh, uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful experience. And there also I had an opportunity to work very closely with the African delegations. Uh, and, uh, the uh, head of the uh, uh, LDC uh, constituency at the time was Ambassador Marping from Lesotho. Uh, and I was pleased to be able to uh, make presentations to the African group uh, on several occasions in the course of my working uh, in Geneva. More importantly, I learned a lot in that process about the difficulties that Africa experiences in uh, accessing global markets. Uh, so uh, that's, these are things that have informed my vision and informed the book. Uh, in this book, you examine the idea that um, industries without smokestakes offer an opportunity for Africa to grow its economy uh, and to propel uh, incomes and to create mass, mass employment uh, for both unskilled and skilled labor. Can you take us through uh, what you consider to be the core ideas of this book and yeah. central argument? Uh, basically, uh, the book came out of the discussion of the role of structural transformation in growth. That is the movement of workers in low productivity activities, such as in agriculture, to higher productivity, uh, higher productivity activities. Uh, uh, it was provoked in part by work that Danny Roderick had done way back in 2012, 2014, when he looked at this problem and sort of uh, uh, perceptively observed that 
uh, labor was not moving out of low productivity activities into high productivity activities in manufacturing. In fact, it was going into services and other things. And he became quite worried or expressed a concern that even though Africa had been growing fairly rapidly up until that point, the absence of structural transformation and movement of labor into manufacturing was going to cause a problem and rather dim the prospects for economic growth. Uh, John Page particularly, but also Finn and, and I, uh, had a light, slightly different experience because we had observed in, in Africa that much of this labor was also moving into things like services. Uh, and so we decided to go into some depth of looking at uh, uh, those activities that shared the same characteristic as manufacturing, uh, but uh, were not technically uh, manufacturing. Uh, and what we sort of, so I think the big idea is that that process of structural transformation that we had seen in East Asia, for example, of moving workers from agriculture into manufacturing and then from manufacturing into services, really didn't seem to obtain in Africa. Rather, we were seeing situations where workers were moving out of agriculture but into services or within various sectors of agriculture, moving from subsistence agriculture into uh, horticulture into some uh, high value added uh, crops, for example. So uh, we wanted to study this process in, in greater detail. And I think we ended up focusing on, on four sectors of, of particular importance. Uh, one is tourism. Uh, the second was horticulture. The third was agro-processing and agro-manufacturing. And fourthly, business services. And if you look at those four sectors, which we call industries without smokestacks, you'll see that, that basically in many countries in Africa, uh, those sectors are growing much more rapidly than is certainly uh, agriculture by itself, or and even in the case of many countries, faster than manufacturing. Uh, and that's not a bad thing. In fact, it's a good thing to the extent that workers are now engaged in high productivity activities. I should also point out that part of this reflects, I think, the different timing of African development as compared to East Asia. East Asia, as you'll remember from the history of Japan and South Korea, maybe uh, Taiwan and uh, the Southeast Asian countries, uh, expanded their growth very rapidly in the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s based on manufacturing. And that was a time before uh, global value chains had emerged as being, in fact, they were the pioneers in this, uh, as being the dominant form of international production. Africa comes into this process at a somewhat later period. Uh, and uh, so what we have seen is that services uh, as part of international trade have become much more important than when uh, East Asia began its uh, rapid growth process. And as a result, Africa is now participating in services exports uh, to a much greater degree than certainly East Asia did in the early days. Of course, there are other things that are involved. The nature of technology has changed rather considerably between the uh, last part of the, uh, the, the 2000 century to the, to the, to the situation today. Uh, and uh, the combination of global value change, the service of servicification of manufacturing, uh, where services are much more important in manufacturing than they once were, all of this has affected the opportunities for Africa uh, in, in its growth pattern and its structural transformation pattern. So those are some of the key ideas, I think, that uh, the process of structural transformation in Africa is much different than it was in uh, uh, East Asia, or even in the, in the current rich countries. Uh, and, uh, and that's an opportunity, uh, as well as uh, uh, presents certain challenges. Uh, if we are to look at it, uh, the idea of industries without smokestacks, uh, if I may say, um, there are countries in, in, our, in the African continent that uh, suitably, adequately apply the idea of investing its labor, investing capital, investing uh, all the attention into industries without smoke, smokestacks to propel growth. But there are other countries, if we are to, 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 to look at the specific industries that we are talking about, there are countries that might not attract that much tourist attraction, uh, countries that might not have the capacity to invest and to grow from investing in industries without smokestacks and are just primarily going to uh, follow the route of agriculture and manufacturing. 
of uh, raw materials and exporting. Do you have uh, any examples from the research that you did that you think are there specific countries that can adequately apply this uh, economic recommendation and produce tremendous results in the forthcoming years? I think you're quite right in pointing out that the structure and uh, latent comparative advantage of African countries is highly differentiated uh, across the continent. You know, you have uh, uh, mineral exporters who are, uh, uh, which are able to use minerals uh, to drive their growth pattern, right? You have uh, other countries that are uh, really have a high comparative advantage in services and, and, and in tourism. That said, I think uh, if you look at the, the bigger picture and look at the number of countries that are involved, we found that looking just at exports, for example, that uh, some two thirds of African countries for which we had data uh, managed to grow their exports in the industries without smokestacks <clears throat> area at least uh, at the same rate as manufacturers or traditional exports, right? And so <clears throat> I think for many countries, these offer, uh, these industries without smokestacks offer opportunities. I guess the point is that not all countries will be able to seize uh, a development and establish a tourism industry, for example, or establish a uh, back office processing uh, uh, telecommunications platform, such as we see in Kenya. Uh, but many will be able to have parts of that and will be able to increase, perhaps at the margin, uh, some of their uh, uh, activities in these industries without smokestacks. In fact, I'd argue that virtually all countries have experienced some new uh, investment in these areas, even those where, uh, let's say, minerals or raw materials or, or oil is, is uh, 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 common. Uh, I guess the, that's one point. The second point is that as countries, all countries that are seeking to diversify their export portfolio, and I think kind of the lesson of this book is that, yes, you should look at manufacturers. They're really important. So uh, that's an important element of uh, uh, developing your comparative advantage and uh, uh, expanding your exports, but also look at other aspects, particularly services, because they too hold enormous, enormous potential in moving workers out of low productivity activities into high productivity activities. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that. Your book challenges conventional interpretations. That is to say the focus on smokestake industries. The, f the focus on manufacturing. Um, I've seen that um, if we are to look at it from the 1950s, uh, at the point that uh, many African countries received independence um, up until the 1990s, the focus was on smokestacks. The focus was on primary production for manufacturing. The manufacturing that did not in itself produce the results that were intended or the results that could propel economic growth in the majority of our countries. And your book now comes to challenge these uh, conventional interpretations. What are some of those uh, limitations that inhibited the growth uh, that is focused on smokestacks? Well, I think uh, one thing we see is uh, that manufacturing uh, as a share of GDP has fallen regardless of per capita income over decades. We have a wonderful graph in the, in the book that you may have seen in the opening chapter, which shows that in uh, across all of the countries, irrespective of per capita income, uh, manufacturing as a share of GDP was pretty high. But each, each decade, going back to the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, that share of manufacturing tends to fall across all countries. Why is that? Well, part of it is the servicification of, uh, of uh, manufacturing itself. But in fact, uh, 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 firms that before tried to keep advertising and uh, uh, engineering service, architectural services, engineering services uh, inside the firm now are outsourcing that information. And so we have springing up uh, you know, architectural firms, uh, engineering firms, uh, energy uh, firms, all of this is, and they serve manufacturing much as does uh, uh, the traditional uh, agriculture in the past. So thinking about the problem of how to promote your development, industry, non-industry, uh, is uh, kind of a message of this book. 
maybe another way of thinking about it is we think about industrial policy. It's not so important to raise tariffs and try to create an auto industry immediately. What's more important is making sure that the industries you do establish are internationally competitive, or maybe you hive off a part of the global value chain that's incipiently being organized, because that turns out to be a much more important driver of growth in a world of global value chains than does the old style import substitution uh, behind high tariff walls. In fact, I think if you look back at the experience of Africa, uh, the high tariffs of the 1960s, 1970s, and 1980s did not produce uh, uh, rapid growth. Rather, they led to, an, uh, and this, by the way, was not only true of Africa, it was also true of Latin America, uh, did not produce uh, massive uh, increases in productivity or rapid growth. Uh, rather, uh, uh, it was kind of misdirected resources into uh, areas that were not going to be internationally competitive. Mm -hmm. So uh, scrolling forward to the 2000s now, I think countries are now uh, focusing much more on trying to establish internationally competitive activities. And here Africa has a tremendous advantage because they have uh, low income labor that's, uh, that's available. They're uh, investing in learning much more. They have access to global technology via the internet. So there's some real opportunities out here. Uh, for Africa to move forward. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that, Professor Richard. In my last segment, I would want you to make a recommendation of just three books uh, that you think they also contribute to this discourse of the political economy of development uh, that, that proffer practical solutions as these uh, to the African economic problem and to uh, propelling growth. Three recommendations of three books that that's coming to your mind. Okay. Uh, one I will uh, might re recommend is uh, 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 Akube, uh, Akube's book on mm -hmm. uh, uh, Made Af in Africa. Exactly. Uh, you, exactly. you might know it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a, it's a wonderful treatise on uh, the development in Ethiopia of the manufacturing mm -hmm. uh, sector. He might give a little more weight than certainly I would to the role of tariff protection in uh, creating industry. I think, and, and uh, subsequently we're seeing in Ethiopia kind of a, a rethinking the tariff structure right now. Uh, too often high tariffs produce inefficient, even monopolistic industries. And so I think uh, rethinking that, but it's really a very nice book uh, that looks at development economics and, and African development, I think in a very positive way. Maybe I'd also uh, mention in this regard, um, can I give an advertisement? Uh, 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 maybe I'd, ever, I'd mention also the other book, which has a similar uh, title that John Page did mm -hmm. uh, called Learning to Compete. Uh, and there, uh, it's a slightly different perspective, but I think uh, it uh, focuses on industrialization in Africa in a way that uh, is a really nice compliment to the other Made in Africa and uh, uh, Ethiopian uh, book. I mean, the two together are really quite nice. And then finally, I, I, this is the advertisement. Uh, we are working with the Brookings Institution now on uh, industries without smokestacks and employment. Uh, and here, Brahimi Kulavali uh, and Aloysius Odu uh, are leading a, uh, a new study. Uh, John Page will be a principal in that study as well. Uh, to look at the effect of industries without smokestack on employment. And one thing that's coming out of that is the importance of education and uh, skill development of workforce and investments in education, uh, because it's that way that you increase productivity. And you also uh, make sure that uh, the broad majority of Africans can participate in the growth process. You know, one problem we, we see kind of, it's quite evident, is that growth has a technology bias towards skills, which means that you create more demand for high skilled workers, their wages go up, and the wages of the others tend to fall behind. Well, the only way to kind of uh, uh, reduce that impetus in the natural growth process is to ensure that the supply of skilled workers through education increases concomitantly with the demand for skilled workers and uh, is able to process the new technology. Uh, and uh, I think that's what we're seeing in Africa. There's more investment, there's more worry about these kinds of considerations. So thinking about education and the kind of work you're doing and your group is doing, I think is terribly important. That is wonderful. Thank you very much, Professor Richard Newfarmer.
viewers and listeners this was professor richard new farmer he is with the international growth center uh, that is a joint venture of the london school of economics and the university of oxford a copy of this book can be accessed on the link that i'm going to paste right in the description panel on the upload for this video and in the comment section on our facebook page this book was published by oxford university press and it was also co-edited by john page and Finn the yes. book is available free mm -hmm. and can be downloaded from the un wider website thank you very much professor richard uh, have a good day thank you very much Chile. wonderful my pleasure